If your Airbnb is bleeding, it's not because of the Airbnb bust, it's probably because you didn't underwrite your Airbnb correctly and you didn't account for all of the expenses that go into running a short-term rental. I feel like I'm in Blade Runner 2049 right now, hold on. There we go. That's a little better. Actually, I like this warm coloring. Let's try a couple different things. Nope. Nope. Oh, definitely not. Ah, <laughs> there we go. Okay, so in today's video, I wanna keep this one short and I wanna to try to show you how to underwrite an Airbnb in two phases. Now, if you're not familiar with the basic concept of underwriting, that just means actually analyzing your Airbnb, running different scenarios, really deep diving and understanding all of the various expenses that you're gonna come across in your short-term rental journey. And day to day, they may not feel like that much, but over time, they really add up. And you can kind of think of it as like a small leak in a canoe, where you're gonna be able to stay afloat for a while and it's no big deal. But if you have another leak and another leak, and another leak and another leak, eventually your canoe sinks, AKA your Airbnb loses so much money that you go out of business and you have to sell it. You say, oh, the Airbnb bus is here. I lost so much money, Airbnb doesn't work. Which I don't think has to be the case if you properly underwrite and analyze your Airbnb. So today I'm gonna walk you through two tiers of analyzation. The first tier being back of the napkin analytics. The second tier being the full on underwriting phase where you sharpen the pencils. So let's get into tier one, the back of the napkin analytics and how I run a super quick gut check on a property to see if it's gonna be profitable. First things first, let's go pick out a property on Redfin very quickly. I'm just gonna go to Gatlinburg really fast because that's the number one short-term rental market in the country. And I know the numbers in this market relatively well. So let's find a three, two really fast. There we go. This is a three bedroom, three bath. So let's work with this one. So 7.25% on a 30 year mortgage. That seems about right at the moment. And then we're gonna assume we're putting 20% down. Our monthly mortgage on this is gonna be 5,532 bucks. 5,500. <laughs> I had to do it, I had to do it. Okay, so that's our monthly mortgage, all right? So right now we're doing back of the napkin. We're just gonna quickly calculate off the top of my head. Here's the mistake that most Airbnb operators make. They take this $5,500 a month number. And they think that's pretty much the only cost involved with running a short term rental. So they'll go on the run comps on AirDNA. They'll pop it into the rentalizer. Rentalizer is gonna say it makes $85,000 a year. Let's check really fast actually. All right, 72,600 bucks. That's what rentalizer says that this property is gonna make. So what they do is they say 72,600 divided by 12, $6,050 minus my mortgage of $5,532. Ooh, I'm gonna make a $500 profit every single month, which we all know isn't the case. So I just wanna run you through a couple of baseline expenses outside of the mortgage to just even see if this property is viable at all, all right? Mortgage, 5,532 bucks. Cleaning fees on a three bedroom, three bath out in Gatlinburg. I suspect you're probably gonna be spending about 175 to 200 bucks on cleaning. So we're gonna say $200. And on average, I have between five to seven stays every single month. So let's take the average of that, which is six days per month. And if I'm paying $200 for a cleaning fee, that's 1,200 bucks. So we're gonna add $1,200 to that. On top of that, you've got utilities. 500 bucks at a minimum in the Smoky Mountains. You could easily spend 600, 700, 800. It just depends. But at a minimum, we're looking at 500 bucks here. And then last expense, I'm gonna put 500 bucks for maintenance. And those are my baseline costs. It doesn't account for refunds. It doesn't account for the Airbnb service fee. It doesn't account for CapEx, AKA capital expenditures. But every single month, I can expect to spend, give me the one, 200, 200. Every single month, I can expect to spend $7,732 in expenses. Multiply that by 12. Every single year, I can expect to spend $92,000 $784. Beautiful handwriting, I know. So at a minimum, just to keep the lights on, we're looking at $93,000 to operate this Airbnb. And that to me is layer number one. This number right here is super important because now I can kind of reverse engineer how much I need to make in order to make a decent return on this property, AKA my cash on cash return. Your cash on cash return is the golden metric in short-term rentals because it basically tells you how much money you're making on your money over the course of a year. So if you invest $100,000 and your profit is $20,000, you have a 20% cash on cash return. 20% for a very long time has been the golden standard. But these days, I think we're looking at more like a 15%. So knowing that I wanna make about a 15% cash on cash return, I can now start to figure out how much my property needs to generate for me to get there. So going down to this calculator right here, we're gonna see that we have to invest 173,600 bucks to buy this property. That's a 20% down payment. And if I wanna make 15% on that money, we're looking at $26,040 meaning I need to make this amount of money, $26,040, on top of the $92,784 that it's gonna cost me to run this Airbnb, which puts me at a grand total of 
and $24. That's how much this property right here on Yona Trail Way has to make for me to make a decent return on this property. Now keep in mind, cash flow isn't everything. There's tax benefits, there's debt pay down, there's appreciation. But for the purposes of this video, we're gonna focus on cash flow. So now I know I need to make $118,824 every single year to have a somewhat profitable Airbnb before we really start hammering the expenses. And now this $118,000 figure right here is really important because it helps guide my analysis and it sets a target for me when I'm analyzing my numbers. I know that when I jump into the comps, AKA the comparable properties, and I start doing my analysis on the different analytics platforms out there that I wanna make about $118,000 at a minimum. And if the data shows me that this property is gonna make less than $118,000, then I can quickly disqualify it and move on to the next property. That's why you have to get really, really fast with this stuff because you need to be able to quickly disqualify properties and move on to the next one. And this back of the napkin approach helps me do that. So let's punch in on this a little bit more. If the data says that this property right here is gonna make 70,000, 80,000, 90,000, or 100,000, it's not really worth my time. I'm throwing this one away. But if the data says I'm gonna make anywhere from 110 to 125,000, then I'm gonna spend a little bit more time analyzing properties in Air DNA. I just want to preface really fast that this video is not about how to analyze your property on AirDNA. If you want to see me work my magic there and actually run analysis on properties online, let me know in the comments down below. I'll make a supplementary video to this video that shows you that process. But for now, let's carry on with the underwriting side of things. Let's say that after running my analysis and running my comps and all that stuff, I determine that this property is going to make $118,000 or more. Then I move on to tier two of underwriting, which is where we sharpen the pencils and we really start hammering the expenses to see is this property actually going to be profitable in the long run. And this unfortunately is where most prospective properties go to die if you know how to analyze them. But a lot of people do this part incorrectly. So pay attention. I'm going to run you through some expenses that you really, really need to know to be successful at this game. Well, sadly, my screen recording did not save, so I've got to restart this section of the YouTube video, but it's fine. <laughs> you didn't just waste an hour of your life recording that. Anyway, Jenny, I'm not a smart man. Let's sharpen some pencils here. So this is a spreadsheet that I give to all of my students. I'll leave a link in the description down below to something very similar to this. It'll allow you to do a pretty similar analysis that we're about to go through here. So I've already put in a lot of the assumptions here. Purchase price, $868,000. ARV is not gonna be relevant here. We're doing a 20% down payment. Our closing costs are gonna be about 2.5%. And so our total cash to close, just from a lending perspective, is $195,000. Now let's jump into the rehab and setup. You might need to do a little bit of work. Typically I do like to budget like, I don't know, $5,000 worth of stuff to paint walls or remove a carpet in a room or spruce up the place in general. Setup expenses are all of the expenses associated with me flying out to a property to set it up. So we're talking plane tickets, rental cars, food, all that good stuff. And then furnishings, I typically find these days that I'm spending 15 to $20 per square foot. I used to say $10 a square foot back in the day, but inflation and supply chain issues and all that really good fun stuff no longer really makes it all that feasible. So I really think $15 a square foot is a good starting point. I'm gonna put 18 and then legal would be like the cost to set up an LLC and anything like that. So I'm spending 41,224 bucks plus the 195K to get this property started. And that's the cash infusion that I'm putting into this property and what we will use to measure the overall cash on cash for this property. We're not gonna get too in the weeds of ROI, return on investment, cash on cash return, but it's a little necessary to get through this spreadsheet right here. Then I've got my financing tab and basically with my 20% down, my actual loan amount is gonna be 694,400 bucks. Interest rates right now are 7.25%. If you're lucky, if you're talking DSCR loans, debt service coverage ratio loans, you could easily be looking at eight to 9%, maybe even more, 30 year term. And so that puts my principal and interest at four $4,737.03. And now let's move on to our revenue. Again, we are assuming that this property is going to make $118,000. I didn't actually run an analysis. This is a hypothetical number just based on the example that I gave earlier. But assuming this property makes $118,000, which sounds like a lot of money, we're not gonna start hammering the expenses, really getting in there and seeing what this property is gonna cost us to run and how profitable it would be at $118,000. So we got our fixed expenses here. We got our property 
taxes, which come out to $13.96, according to Redfin. We've got our insurance, which comes out to about $53.76. Some of you might be thinking that's pretty high, but remember, short-term rental insurance does tend to be more expensive. You might be able to beat this, but I think that this is actually a fair assumption here. HOA comes out to $230 a month or $27.60 a year. And then my principal and interest here is $4,737, meaning that my fixed expenses, PITI, principal interest taxes insurance, HOA, comes out to $5,500. 531 bucks or $66,376 a year. Now most people will say, great, that's amazing. This property makes 118,260 bucks. Now I'm gonna subtract 66,376 dollars and my profit is 51,884 dollars. Woohoo! But as you're about to see, that's not exactly how running a short-term rental works because there are a lot of variable expenses that go up or down depending on how many guests you host and how much or little you make. This is gonna be the most important part of this video, so please pay attention, save this video, and if you find value from it, like it because if you do, more people will see this video and hopefully we can stop them from making a bad investment before they make it. That's my goal here on the channel. With that said, let's get into the variable operating expenses associated with running a short-term rental. You got your OTA service fees. What does OTA mean? Online travel agency. This is Airbnb, Verbo, Booking.com, or whoever you use. Now, Airbnb charges 3% to the hosts, and Verbo charges 8%. Now, now using the 80-20 rule, which is you get 80% of your bookings from Airbnb, 20% from Verbo, the weighted average here is gonna be 4%. So you're gonna be paying 4% on this $118,000 figure here to Airbnb, Verbo, whoever. Then we get into maintenance. We have this here at roughly 150 bucks a month. That could be low, that could be high. When it rains, it pours. And typically, a good way to estimate this is three to 5% of your revenue. Now, I have this entered in here at 3%, which comes out to $295 a month or $35.40 a year. Now, if you don't spend $3,540 every single year, woohoo! Except you will probably the next year when it all compounds because maybe you're not good at keeping up with the maintenance of your property. And like I said, once the maintenance starts coming in, it starts to pile up a little quicker than you think. So I would definitely plan for this. Then we get into CapEx reserves. This right here is what bites most people in the bootay. CapEx means capital expenditures. These are the really big improvements that you're gonna make on your property over the course of owning it for 30 years. Capital expenditures would include things like a roof replacement or replacing your appliances. Appliances. Remember on the maintenance side of things when I said it rains, it pours? Well, this is actually more true for capital expenditures. If I had a dollar for every single time two or three things happen in the row within two or three months of each other at my properties, I would not need an Airbnb business. I could just survive on that income. So most people here are not educated in this and this is where a lot of people go out of business because let's say that you make $10,000 a year for three years and you don't pocket anything for capital expenditures. Let's say on year three, you have an AC that needs to be repaired or replaced for 8,000 bucks and you weren't saving for it. Now your profit for that year is 2,000 bucks. But what happens when your water heater goes out? Then you gotta spend $2,000 to replace that and guess what? You're at a break even for that year and you've worked your butt off to self-manage this property that actually didn't make any money for you at all. And guess what? You have bad luck and something else breaks like your refrigerator, which has happened to me. And not only do you have to replace the refrigerator itself, but maybe you have to refund a guest who doesn't get to use the refrigerator. They bought a ton of groceries and now they're mad and disgruntled that their food is going to waste. <sighs> and then you gotta refund them, which we'll get to in a second. But capital expenditures are something you should absolutely be putting aside and saving for. You'll be very thankful that you did. Now we get into supplies. Your supplies are gonna be things like your soaps, your toilet paper, paper towels, coffee that you might leave out, carcass disinfectant, body oil remover, and everything in between. We usually budget for something like this anywhere from 60 to 75 bucks a room. In here I have it at $60. So it's gonna cost me 2,160 bucks a year to stock my Airbnb. Then we got refunds and guest gifts. This could be refunding a guest for something that you messed up, for the refrigerator breaking, or it could be a guest gift. Like you like to leave a little champagne if you find out that it's someone's anniversary, or instead of refunding a guest, you might say, hey, I'm so sorry that the refrigerator is broken. We're gonna get someone out to take care of that today, but in the meantime, why don't you go have dinner and it's on me while we get this taken care of for you. I think 100 bucks a month is actually 
on the low end, you might find that you refund guests a little bit more than that, but it's a good starting point. We don't actively refund guests. We try to fix the problem and apologize profusely and just be hospitable and try to be action taking hosts. And most guests appreciate that, but we can't always avoid refunds. Utilities, I have this at about 500 bucks a month for a property this size. Another rule of thumb that isn't quite as conservative as I'd like is 15% of the square footage every single month. So that would be 1,818 square feet for this particular property times 15 15%, which comes out to $272 a month in utilities. But for me, I like to aim a little high here because in the summer months, people really do crank up that AC. So I like to plan for that. Then you got landscaping and snow removal. If you're in a snowy market, you might have to pay someone every month to come do some snow removal in the winter, but come cut your grass in the summer. So that's a hundred bucks a month. Internet, about a hundred bucks a month. I mean, 80 bucks seems to be a little bit more common for most of my properties. And then hot tub, pool maintenance. I think I spend about 250 bucks a month here per property, except in the Smoky Mountains where my cleaners do that for me. But let's just pretend like this property isn't in the Smoky Mountains. I'm usually gonna be spending between 150 and 250 pretty consistently on hot tub maintenance. Management. Then we got our cleaning, which I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about here because there's this notion that cleaning is a pass-through, so we shouldn't calculate for it. And I haven't done a really good job being clear about this or emphasizing this enough, so I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about this. Cleaning fees are a pass-through. What this means is that a guest pays for the cleaning fee, so it's not an actual expense for you. However, you do collect that cleaning fee and then you pass it on to your cleaners. But because you collect that cleaning fee, you still have to account for that in your total revenue. So in this $118,000 gross revenue figure, your cleaning fees are in there. So let me show you what I mean here. So cleaning fees are typically for a three bedroom, three bath and the Smokies anywhere from 175 to 225. I'm gonna go 200 on this. And I typically host about six people a month. So we're looking at 1200 bucks a month that I'm gonna be paying to my cleaners every single month or $14,400 a year. Now this $14,400 a year is not something I'm coming out of pocket to pay, but it is included in this $118,260 figure. Meaning when you subtract that, that this property is actually grossing closer to 103,860 bucks. And this is where most people go wrong because they don't properly calculate their cleaning fees and on a lot of short-term rentals, 14,000 bucks can be your profit. So if you don't account for that, you could have a break-even Airbnb. Sorry for the sidebar there, but I just wanted to be mega clear moving forward on this channel because I feel a lot of the analytics platforms out there aren't super consistent and have been a little finicky on if and when cleaning fees are included in their estimates, making me unclear and finicky, which I don't like. So hopefully this helps. Let's get into our final piece here, which is gonna be your property management system and dynamic pricing software. I'm typically looking at about $70 a month for my tech stack. That's my property management system. That's my pricing software, that's my guidebooks, all of the tech that I use to run my property. And so when you add all my variable expenses up, we are looking at $3,893 a month in variable expenses or 46,710 bucks. Now, when you add our fixed cost to this, our fixed costs actually come out to $9,424 a month to keep the lights on at my property when it's occupied, or $113,000 a year. Now, hopefully you're understanding why you gotta sharpen your pencils, because my first gut check here had my expenses at 7,732 bucks per month. But now as we start to actually sharpen pencils, we see that I'm about 1,700 bucks off it's actually $9,400 a month to run this property. And that's a big difference because now we know that this property every month cash flows profit $431 a month or $51.73 a year, which changes things quite a bit. I don't even have management fees in here because I teach people how to self-manage. That is my passion. That's what this channel is built on. That's what Host Camp is built on. I don't like delegating to property management companies because I just don't think they're gonna do it better than you. If you're someone that's passionate about hosting, no one is gonna care more about your property than you. So management fees, I'm gonna keep at 0%, but this calculator, you know, if you put 20%, you can see this property would actually lose about $18,000 a year. $18,000 a year, that I'd rather keep. So now based on that information, I can see that my year one cash on cash return is a 2.2%. I want a 15% cash on cash return. So now I can sort of reverse engineer and figure out what this property needs to make for me to hit that benchmark. And so just messing around with the numbers here, 
if this property grosses $150,380, that's where I'll get my 15% return. So now I would go back into the comps and see, is it possible for this property to make $150,000 or anywhere near that? And if the answer is yes, then I go back here and I sharpen pencils again, and I go back and forth and I do this process over and over and over again. And that's why tier two of underwriting takes so much longer. Most people stop at tier one or tier 1.5 or some version of what I just took you through. And that's why when you hear someone say, my Airbnb is bleeding money, probably because they didn't analyze their Airbnb correctly and it's costing them thousands of dollars. I really hope this has been helpful. I know I haven't done content quite so in the weeds like this in a while, but I'd like to start again because I actually miss talking about the fundamentals and the SOPs, standard operating procedures that go along with running a short-term rental business. So if you like this video, do me a favor, like it down below, let's share the word. And with that, meeting adjourned. And I've got one more thing. You may have seen me underwriting this at a 7.25% interest rate and thought to yourself, well, Rob, that's a really high interest rate. That makes investing in properties so much harder and way less profitable. But this right here is my student, Cody. And I actually just helped him close on this property at a 5% interest rate. And he did this all without having to go to a bank or without having to show tax returns or any of that. And because he was able to get this property at a 5% versus the market average of 7.25 to 8.5%, he's actually gonna cash flow significantly more. If you want to learn how Cody did this, there's a link in the description down below that'll walk you through the principles of creative hosting. 